This afternoon, for those who, who come, and you're all welcome, it's a talk I used to give in Fiji over a couple of years when we were living there, different churches, Adventist churches. It's not attacking anybody. It's presenting a history of dissenting movements in our church. And I simply go through uh, about 35 or so different dissenting movements, starting from Owen Crozier, yes, who wrote out Hiram Edson, crossing the cornfield and gave us our sanctuary insight, starting with him, later deserted Adventism, coming through pastors, uh, Case and Hall, uh, uh, Russell uh, and uh, Stevenson. Let me just get out my list here, which uh, it's somewhere here. Here it is. Uh, Stevenson and Hall, Case and Russell, Snook and Brinkerhoff, all in the 1850s. Up to the 1860s, we had no formal church organisation. So in some sense, these people weren't really offshoots. They were... Adventism in the first 15 years was a coalition of independent ministries, really. We had no official credentialing system. There was no official general conference, uh, and so on and so forth. No training institution to issue ministerial credentials. And so it took 15 years for us to get us organised. And then in the 1860s, we saw a, a um, coalition into the General Conference and the first General Conference uh, appointed as such uh, in 1860, 61, two, three, were the organising years. 1870s, Dudley Canwright, the most quoted uh, and divisive Adventist dissident in our history, Anna Garmeyer in the 1880s, the 1888 Minneapolis church split between the signs of the Times editors at Wagner and Jones and Uriah um, Smith and George Butler at the Review and Herald, East versus West Coast, I'll talk about a bit about that. 1890s, we have Stanton, we have Anna Phillips, who was believed by some of the leading uh, Adventist leaders to have the prophetic gift. Wagner and Jones then went off the rails. We had the Holy Flesh movement in the 1890s in Indiana, Davis and Donnell, and Ellen White had to address that. Also coming out of that I I period was J John Harvey Kellogg and the Kellogg and the pantheism crisis around the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Then we had A.F. Ballinger, Albion Fox Ballinger. We come to the Rowanites, Margaret Rowan, one of the most uh, colourful dissidents in our, in our history. A Hollywood film ought to be made about Margaret Rowan. She ended up in prison for theft, fraud and plotting to kill one of the leaders of the church. Uh, Louis Conradi in the 19-teens uh, caused the formation of the German Reform, Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement over the issue of pacifism, conscientious objection. And then in the 1920s, we had W.W. W. Fletcher, William Ward Fletcher, a Christian gentleman, as he's often called, Avondale teacher. Eventually, he uh, decided he could not uh, stay with the uh, remnant church. In uh, the United States, we had J.K. Humphrey, one of the few black dissident movements uh, and their uh, idea of utopia, causing him to uh, split off and form the United Sabbath-day Adventists. Talk a bit about this later. Victor Houteff in the 1930s, Maytag washing machine salesman who uh, gave rise to the shepherd's rod. And I know some of you here are old enough to remember the shepherd's rod, because I certainly do. They were interesting characters, always used to come to camp meeting. Uh, Blacktown, Nunawading is my experience with the shepherd's rod. They gave rise in the 1950 to Ben Roden and his wife Lois, who started the branch. The branch then evolved into the Branch Davidians and David Koresh, who is more famous, uh, Branch Davidian. But I worked with a Branch Davidian uh, in, in the 1970s, and Ron Wilson, I'm sure, will remember him as well. We used to have very interesting discussions. Uh, it, it, it was an um, interesting period with the uh, Branch Davidians in that time. I met Fred Steed, another guy. There was... Uh, 
the Bingham Bashan movement of the 1960s out of the Philippines came Likayen and his Root of Jesse movement. I don't know whether some of you Filipino back, uh, uh, members would, uh, would remember or know about the Root of Jesse movement. There was Robert Grieve in the 1950s as well, uh, president of the Queensland Conference. He eventually left and took many members with him. And of course, in the 1950s, we discuss, I'll go through the questions on doctrine controversy, the most divisive book ever to be published in Adventism, according to, to some of our historians, George Knight among them. Wheeland and Short, uh, 1888 re-examined. I'll discuss what those brethren were on about. We'll look at Fred Wright, uh, met him, Kay Cullen, Robert Brinsmead, of course, the most troublesome, according to Adventist historians, remains a good friend of mine. I'm not afraid of dissenters and dissidents because I know what I believe and I respect friendship. And uh, Robert Brinsmead is uh, one of the most outstanding minds I've ever met for someone who's unqualified. He's also a very humble man, slept in my house, on the floor, on a mattress, despite being a multi-zillionaire. Uh, and so uh, Robert Brinsmead I will talk about, but certainly the, the, the perfectionism of Robert Brinsmead's teaching makes most of the perfectionism I've seen in Adventism since the 1960s uh, look like uh, stale Big Macs left in the sun. Uh, it, they're, just, uh, they're not fresh, they're not new. And I'll talk about, about what his contribution was, but sadly he's no, not a member of the Adventist uh, congregation anymore. The Lord's Army of Seventh-day Christians, the Transformation Army, met members of them, Bible Revelations, Dennis Friend, Verlis Johnson's 11th Hour Adventist Remnant Church, the Isaac Branch, and some of the descending movements have got very interesting uh, names. And of course, I'll finish up with Des Ford, who, who died recently. So that's this afternoon. I'm not going to talk about any of them in any detail here. And uh, we will, I'll give you a little history of, of our church. I'm, I'm not at all uh, disturbed by the fact that we have so many descending movements in our history. We have always been a very interesting Bible-studying church. And people who go to their Bibles, like, as you would know, are energised constantly. We have a common historic faith and we have a principle of progressive enlightenment. So we are always looking to develop our faith, our understanding, our knowledge. Okay, so that's this afternoon. Today's topic, I just want to talk a bit about as a, as a pretext to that, who we are. Who am I? Who are you? Who are we? In the first place, I'm one of about seven and a half billion people on the planet. Might sound a lot until I went online and found there are about ten quintillion insects on the planet. I didn't know what a quintillion is, but it's 10 with 18 zeros. So maybe the insects inherit the earth after global warming has completely ruined it for us. Uh, okay, they say there's going to be 11 billion in the, by the uh, end of the next 50 years, perhaps. We're, we are nevertheless populating the earth differentially too. In the first week of 2001, first week of 2001, India achieved the total increase in population that all the EU countries together for the year 2000. In one week, India did what it took all of the EU one year to do. Eight million people on the planet of the earth a long time ago now, eight million are added every five weeks. And they're mostly Indian, Chinese, Indonesian, Pakistani, and Nigerian. The world is changing, changing colour, changing complexion. 
Those are just some of the numbers. I feel insignificant and I'm also not who I seem to be. I'm not German, although I have a German surname. I'm not Tongan, even though I look Tongan. I'm not Jewish, even though I have a Jewish grandparents. I'm not Fijian, even though that was my birthplace. Perhaps like you, I'm an Australian, an Aussie. Well, this is what it means to be an Aussie. And uh, forgive me for being very quick here, but it's not perhaps what you think it is. The origins of my Australianness means that if I wore pyjamas to bed, they were an East Indian invention. The bed I slept in was an Egyptian, Turkish or Iranian invention. Anthropologists and archaeologists will argue about that. The cotton sheets I pull up, Pakistan. The linen, East Egyptian. The woolen blankets originally came from Turkey. The silk, Southeast Chinese. The spinning and weaving process to put all that together, Afghanistan. We have dunas, they're Scandinavian. I operate in a 24-hour day. Egyptian, seven-day week, Babylonian Iraqi. A clock, medieval Europe, it's plastic, that's British. I had a bathroom wash, Pakistan, water from a glass, Egyptian, looked in the mirror, Turkish, standing on glazed tiles, Babylonian, porcelain, North China, Toilet, Pakistan, toilet paper, Chinese, enamel sink, bronze Mediterranean, bronze age Mediterranean, bathtub, Pakistan, shower, I did have, Greek, soap, southern Iraq, toothbrush, European, shave, no, I haven't had a shave for a while, but that would be Egyptian or Sumerian, use a razor, that would be Indian, towel off, Turkish, sat on a chair, Arabic, Palestinian, Tailored clothes, first worn by Mongols. Buttons, European, 4000 BC. Shoes, Greek or Egyptian. Sandals, Iraqi. Necktie, somebody's got a necktie, I hope. There, there's one. Croatian, 17th century. Watch, French, German. Spoon or fork for my hot drink, Roman. Coffee, no coffee today. Ethiopian or Yemeni. Cappuccino, Italian, instant coffee, Japanese, cream in the coffee, Greek, orange juice, Mediterranean, toast, Scandinavian, butter, Egyptian, eggs, Southeast Asian, my hat, East Asian, umbrella required yesterday, Indian, public transport, train or bus rather, English, coins for the offering, Turkish, notes, Chinese, Put away my newspaper, it's Semitic characters, paper Chinese, printing German, ink Egyptian, pen Chinese, I have a university degree, Greek, a degree is Chinese, a university is Greek, it's Mother's Day, which is a bit like a birthday, birthdays are Persian, birthday cakes are Greek, ice cream with the birthday cake, that's Indian, and of course we are here to pray and praise to our God in an Indo-European language. That's what it means to be an Australian, perhaps, today. So, we know that. We're multicultural, but our multiculturalism isn't just here now recently. It's thousands of years in the making, and people have to remember that. I could go on and on telling you about some of the firsts from Egypt, from Babylon, and from Rome. But I won't. I'm also a Christian. And you are too. What does that mean for me? That means we're brothers and sisters in a new family. It means we are a universal community of co-equal disciples. It means we are the new Israel grafted into God's choices elected as such, chosen as such, called each of us. It means we're beloved in the Son. Being a Christian means to be defined by your faith in the love of God. It's to be defined by love.
for God and for your neighbour. It's to be defined by grace, charity towards others. Being a Christian means having the fruits of the Spirit and having the gifts of the Spirit. Being a Christian means being anointed and authorised for mission. It means, in my little list, we are God's refuge and his sanctuary. Is that true? You and I are one of about 2.34 billion Christians in the world, about half of whom are Catholic. That's right. We belong to a Christian denomination that's one of about 30,000 in the world. Lots of different types of Christian, in other words. Our denomination, Adventism, has about 20 million followers, I think. That's about the number of Roman Catholics in India. The number of Catholics in Brazil and Mexico alone is equal to the total population of the United States. Just to give you some idea of proportions. So what is our Christian name? I spoke a bit about earlier. In 1860, when meetings were held, we could have been called Seventh-day people. That was one suggestion that went up. Another, Seventh-day door shutters. Tell me if you like any of these and <laughs> I'll put in a request that the General Conference reconsider changing us back to some of these names. Sabbath-keeping Adventists. Not bad. Shut door Seventh-day Sabbath and Annihilationists. Ooh, there's a, there's a strong one. Uh, the Scattered Flock. The Church of God. The Remnant. And finally, a fellow called David Hewitt came up with Seventh-day Adventist. And that's how we have been known ever since. I also think of us as the Church of God and I always th also think of us as Scattered Flock and as the Remnant. I don't think those names are necessarily bad. It's just not our official name. We are Ellen White's church, and I mean that seriously. We are Ellen White's church. I know there are Adventists who are not fans of Ellen White, but in many ways, I hope I, you don't, off I don't offend anyone by this confession, I'm in many ways a Whitist as much as I am an Adventist. That does not mean we're an Ellen White cult. It means we are heirs of a common faith, an established orthodoxy in Christianity that came through the Reformation to us through Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Melanchthon over 2,000 years and before them, Augustine and Anselm and Aquinas. Yes, Greg? But as I said before, we are also holders of a progressive, of a principle of progressive enlightenment. That gives us a distinctive mission, mission and a unique identity. And of course, from last quarter's lessons, Book of Revelation, Book of Daniel, impressed that on us as it should. The Remnant Church is organised. Ellen White said, there's no such thing as every man's being independent. We're organised into a cohesive structure. The Remnant Church is also imperfect. Perfection, she said, exists only in our imagination. We'll talk a bit about that later this afternoon. The confession of a remnant church, an Adventist church, and the confession of a Christian is this. I am not Jesus. He is my teacher. I follow him to know more about him, to be with him, to learn from him. I've made that point in the last couple of presentations. Being a remnant church Adventist Christian means I am also not you. Your journey 
is your journey. You are working out your salvation. I'm working out mine. You are not me. We are not our, each other's creators. I did not give you the law. I am not your judge. I am not your saviour. Jesus is. And I hope you hold that same attitude towards the person sitting next to you. We are a charitable, room to move, tolerant, diverse community of co-equal disciples. We do not lord it over each other as the Pharisees do, as Jesus put it. We share a common faith, an established doctrine, but as I say, we are also uniquely individual and uniquely collectively configured. We have a common mission. Go to all nations and make them my disciples. Amen? Amen. Go. It means be gone. <laughs> what are you waiting for? Right? Go to all nations. Make them my disciple. The Greek word for disciple can be translated, Brother Brian, to mean discipline. Discipline the nations. Bring them into conformity with my word. I don't see too much Christian disciplining going on. I see a lot of Christian surrender to the secular atheist spirit of the age. I was talking to a couple of Christian young men yesterday and my heart rose because I realised not, it's not a problem of age. That the way I look at the world is not a problem of age. It is there are young people who are equally disturbed about the patterns in our society and the way in which it is getting more and more against the law to testify to your Christianity in public. My gosh, I think back to when we were street preachers in the 70s. Couldn't be done now. That's our common mission. We have a common message. We proclaim Christ nailed to the cross said Paul, 1 Corinthians 1.23. To the Jews, a trap, a scandal. To the nation, stupidity. We do not preach ourselves, said Paul, 2 Corinthians 4.5. We have a common method. Lots of methods, but we have a common method. Become all things to all, he said, so as to undoubtedly save some. Ellen White was deeply committed to the common message of Christianity. Hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. This is our message, our argument, our doctrine, our warning to the impenitent, our encouragement for the sorrowing, the hope for every believer. Do you believe that? Thank you. The sacrifice of Christ, she wrote, as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. This is to be the foundation of every discourse. Amen. Thank you. But we also have a context. In early writing, she describes this. A train was shown me going with the speed of lightning. The angel bade me look carefully. I fixed my eyes upon the train. It seemed that the whole world was on board. Then she showed me the conductor, a fair, stately person whom all the passengers looked up to and reverenced. I was perplexed and asked my attend attending angel who it was. He said, it is Satan. He is the conductor. He has taken the world captive and they are all going with lightning speed to perdition. What a vision to have. Wow. If those words were true... Back in the 1850s, they're certainly, certainly true now. That's the context for us as a unique people with a unique mission, with a unique message. Ellen White believed in the common faith, we've just amended it. But she also saw that we matter, we as Adventists. God will have a people upon the earth to maintain. The Bible. 
and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. Amen? Amen. Yes, we matter. In a special sense, she writes in ninth volume of Testimony, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. They've been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second and third angel's message. There is no other work of so great importance. Amen? Amen. Respect and honour God. Give him the glory. Worship the creator. His judgment hour has arrived. Babylon has fallen. Keep the commandments and hold to the faith of Jesus. Our uniqueness is spelled out by Ellen in the sixth volume of the Testament. He's quoting Revelation 14. She says, This distinctive banner is to be borne throughout the, through the world to the close of probation. All heaven is waiting, she writes in Acts of the Apostle, for men and women through whom God can reveal the power of Christianity. If there was a time to start, to start revealing that power, my friends... My Frankston brothers and sisters, it certainly is now. The hour of his judgment is come, she writes, points to the closing work of Christ's ministration for the salvation of men. It heralds a truth that must be proclaimed until the Saviour's return to earth to take his people to himself. Our church is God's agency, empowered by him to do a special work. Empowered by him to do a special work. You don't need to find the power. God will empower you. Go to all nations. Make disciples of them. Ellen White's commendation to us is this. In volume 6 of the Testimonies, Never be ashamed of your faith. Never be found on the side of the enemy. Amen, Norman. Those who really possess the religion of Christ will not be ashamed nor afraid to bear the cross. This is not the time to haul down our colours to be ashamed of our faith. She writes, in reviewing our past history, having travelled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God, as I see what the Lord has wrought, I'm filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. The remnant has failed. I'm talking about the old remnant. The original remnant has failed terribly. The best that the old remnant could do was crucify Jesus. After all the thousands of years that God had led them as a people, from Abraham, Moses, all their prophets, the best that Israel could come up with, the holiest people of Israel took Jesus Christ and put him on the cross. Friends, we never want to do that. But it's a warning to us. Being God's chosen is no guarantee of your success if that is your source of your pride. Let me finish with a couple more Ellen Whites and texts very quickly. I want a humble heart, she wrote in 1876, a meek and quiet spirit, wherein my feelings have been permitted to arise. In any instance, it was wrong. False prophets don't admit their mistakes. I wish that self should be hid in Jesus. False prophets are all about this. I wish self to be crucified. I do not claim infallibility or even perfection of Christian character. That's a true prophet talking. I am not free from mistakes and errors in my life. She wrote that. Had I followed my saviour more closely... I should not have to mourn so much my unlikeness to his dear image. Amen? Amen. Finally, in 1909, towards the end of a life, 
I may be lost, and my son may be lost, but the dear Lord has a remnant people that will be saved and go through to the kingdom. And it remains with each of us as individuals whether or not we will be one of that number. Amen? You were bought with a price, says Paul. Glorify God in your body. You were not redeemed with corruptible things, says Peter, like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, the flawless and unspotted blood of Christ. My prayer for you, Frankston, this morning is that, again, in the words of Paul, since God in his mercy has given us this ministry, we never lose heart. We never lose heart. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, who is our saviour, our teacher, our lawgiver, our judge. And soon our best friend will be coming back through the clouds to collect us to be with him for eternity. Thank you for the opportunity you have given everyone here. Be with us all this Sabbath, the day that you have blessed. Help us to raise the banner, to stand true to you and to stand up for you in these very difficult times. Bless all the children, the families here today too, especially, and the mothers. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.